the time now is very much like at the beginning of the internet where there are organizations that are just going completely AI native that live and breathe AI that are thinking about how to bring it into all of their processes and then there are organizations that are like oh yeah we're aware of this and we think uh, we may have a strategy around it. We want to make products that we can use ourselves and really enjoy and, and have you know no qualms with using them above any other competitor products in our potential price range or lives, products that we can recommend to our friends and family. Hi, this episode is sponsored by Salonis, the global leader in process mining. AI has landed and enterprises are adapting, giving customers slick experiences and the technology to deliver. The road feels long, but you're closer than you think. You see, your business processes run through many systems, creating data at every step. Salonis reconstructs this data to generate process intelligence, a common business language. With process intelligence, AI knows how your business flows across every department, every system, and every process. With AI solutions powered by Salonis, enterprises get faster, more accurate insights, a new level of automation, and a step change in productivity, performance, and customer satisfaction. Process intelligence is the missing piece in the AI-enabled tech stack. Search Salonis, C-E-L-O-N-I-S, to find out more. This episode is sponsored by Digimark, the leader in digital watermarking. Digimark digital watermarks invisibly guard your digital assets to protect against misuse, prove copyright ownership, and verify authenticity. In the era of artificial intelligence, don't leave your images and other digital content exposed. Demand superior content protection and maintain trust in your brand with Digimark. So I'm Alex Klein. Um, I'm, uh, I'm 33. I uh, live in London. Um, I've got a team here of uh, 30 people. We've been working together for uh, over 10 years now, many of us. Um, and our company creates products that are designed to leverage the most uh, advanced technologies to relieve people's suffering on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and how the idea of STEM came about, um, we actually did not come to music via targeting music as an industry. We were, hmm. the very first product we made um, back in 20, 13 was a bright orange box. It's actually behind me above my head, filled mm. with color coded computer components and a storybook, a page by page storybook that would show you how to put the components together. Um, it was a STEM computer kit. It was a STEM toy. It was one of actually the first STEM products that would teach kids about STEM. So you could buy it from Toys R Us, buy it from Target. Uh, it was originally the first user was my six-year-old cousin Mika who wanted to build his own mm -hmm. computer um, and those sold under the brand name Kano. Um, Kano was named after the founder of Judo who was a Japanese primary school teacher named Kano Jigoro. So that's like um, chapter one for us. We had this notion that um, you know we live in this world. I used to be a journalist actually so I used to work at um, the New Republic, uh, Newsweek Daily Beast, um, written stories for New York Magazine, The Nation. I was covering things like um, Occupy Wall Street, um, uh, Mitt Romney's uh, tax returns, uh, the Church of Scientology, just a wide range of sort of political, economic, some tech, Instagram's acquisition. Have had a sort of passing relationship with the Times, actually, Craig, because uh, uh, Jill Abramson was one of my journalism teachers in university. Oh, yeah, really? For real, yeah. Where, where was she teaching? She she taught a course at Yale. She was uh, she taught a journalism oh. course at Yale. Yeah. This is while she was editor or or before. This was uh, this was I believe before where she she at the time was was deputy editor or she 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 had some... right yeah she was deputy for a while yeah yeah exactly. Um, 
very interesting person. So we, we went on a tour of the times and um, I've always had a, in fact, I applied for an internship at the times in university it was rejected. It's unbelievable. You know, my, my career, my career might've gone very differently uh, had I been accepted, but um, it, yeah, yeah, you're probably, um, um, it's probably good that you were rejected rather than getting sucked into uh into the vortex of the times, yeah. The the, the journalism world was super um, welcoming to me at that time. I was like a college student and I was able to get a few internships here and there. And I was into computer science and I was using early data collection techniques to build infographics and that kind of stuff. Um, but I think the, the, the kind of spirit of like, being a, a working journalist, um, I was at uh, Tina Brown's Newsweek Daily Beast kind of carried into STEM, you know, which was the idea that, well, what if you could build a, a, a technology product and a technology ecosystem where the idea wasn't just like you get delivered of this and you just, it zombifies you. What if you could get a piece of technology that you could actually see how it works and put the pieces together yourself and participate um, more in the technology that you use every day. And so that idea carried through to what eventually became the STEM player, which uses generative AI to generate uh, the pieces, the puzzle pieces of any song you throw at it. And then you can just isolate the vocal, isolate the drum, or even put the pieces of different songs together as simply as putting together Legos or even automatically. Um, so uh, yeah, that's the journey from kind of journalism to stem computer kits for kids sold over a million of those around the world work with warner brothers disney microsoft was an investor and then three years ago did our first music product the stem player which eventually became a collaboration with uh kanye west um kanye west. that's how a lot of people <clears throat> discovered the device yeah, I want to back up a little bit the the uh, the storybook uh, stem uh, construction uh, product. I mean, you know, I'm I spent most of my adult life in China, mm -hmm. and I uh, I was very early in my career in the garment trade. We were manufacturing in China, so I have a familiarity with. Uh, contracting manufacturers to build stuff. And, and as a matter of fact, these glasses, uh, which are red because I lose my reading glasses all the time. So I buy them red and I can always spot them around the room. Uh, and I got tired of paying $15 a month, or $15 a pair online. And I went on Alibaba, found uh, an eyeglass manufacturer, uh, found one that had a style I liked, picked the color, and I bought a minimum order of 120 <laughs> pair. So I've got eyeglasses for the rest of my life. But my point is that I'm kind of familiar with that to me is not a huge barrier having an idea and then finding a, a manufacturer uh, to, to make it uh, physical. And I've, I've done that, you know, in, as I said, in, in the garment trade and different, uh, different uh, different projects in my life but how that, you know that's that's not obvious to a lot of people a lot of people see that as you know a lot of people have ideas but actually manufacturing a product is beyond their their imagination and, uh, and capability so how did you come about doing that yeah I, I, it's it's a great point i mean at, at that time so i come out of journalism i'd uh, gone to um, get a master's degree in Cambridge. So I was doing an MPhil in politics, maybe with a view to like going back and continuing writing in politics. And um, my cousin at the time was, you know, he, he'd been like a sort of tech forward internet guy for a while, journalism as well. He was like involved in the telegraph, bringing the, the telegraph to the internet. And he knew of this technology in, um, in Cambridge called the Raspberry Pi. Um, which you might have heard. sure, yeah. So I, yeah. yeah. he put me onto it, and then I sat down with Eben Upton, who had effectively invented the concept of the Raspberry Pi, taking a a development board for mobile phone uh, demonstration, basically a reference board, and redesigning the layout so that you could, you know, basically run a full operating system with full Linux distribution on it, 
and it had started selling like hotcakes largely, I think, because people were doing something similar to what you did with the eyeglasses, but with sensors and buttons, buying those from, you know, markets from Alibaba, from, from the East, assembling their own sort of maker projects at home with the Raspberry Pi as the brain. So doing things like, you know, making a, um, like a submarine, like an autonomous submarine, making like a, a weather balloon with a camera in it and taking pictures of the earth and running Bitcoin miners and different clusters. And it was this whole sort of uh, cottage enthusiast homebrew computer club situation. And there was this guy at the center of it called Eben. He was at Cambridge. I was at Cambridge. So my cousin was like, you should go talk to him. And I actually went to interview him like for a story. Like I was going to pitch a story on this back to Newsweek and I was just interested in it myself. And he shared with me all these challenges about he basically, you know, there's so much demand for this, but people, people have trouble understanding it. You know, people have trouble getting into it and mm -hmm. sort of the success that they had had manufacturing this plus the challenge of, um, accessibility that the product had made me think like, you know, I didn't really know what I was going to do next. I was like, well, what if and my cousin was, was like into the idea and into working with me on it. And, you know, he had a bit of capital. And so he was like, well, why don't we do this? Like I will invest in this thing and you build me a product that like me, you and my six year old son can build together. You know, you, you know, design, you know, tech, you like to write, write a book, like write a book to put the pieces of this, computer together and that was the first product it was like really a family affair like you know on the living room in uh, in their apartment met up um with friends showed it to them i was introduced to this israeli guy who had operations experience from a company called keter an injection molded plastic chair company in israel that kind of like symbiosis of our relationship worked out really nicely and uh, yeah, we launched the first product on Kickstarter, which was a huge thing back then. It broke all these yeah. codes and that kind of launched the mass production of the first STEM computer devices. So I, I think I was fortunate to meet the right people and to um, uh, have to kind of start my company at a time when people were starting to get into the idea of electronics manufacturing on a like hobbyist scale, um, which wasn't all, was definitely not possible. Um, 20 years ago um and just went through a big jump in accessibility when, when things like the raspberry pi and other things came along yeah and what were you doing at cambridge i studied uh, political economy so i was studying public debt um tr treasury uh the u.s treasury the uk central bank and the uh in the kind of relationship between high levels of um securitized public debt in what were called at the time developed economies and growing levels of socioeconomic inequality in society and looking to see if I could gain enough of an econometric understanding of the two phenomena to make an argument that they were connected. So it was sort of deep economics research, which around a sort of counterintuitive theme that like greater public debt equals greater inequality when, uh, you know, typically it was thought at the time, well, you take on a big public debt to equalize society, have a welfare state and system that, you know, gives everyone a safety net and a fair starting point. Um, and I was, I was sort of arguing that the, in principle, yes, but in practice, the large um, sprees of um, monetary base expansion that the central banks had been on had not um, been channeled into you know, welfare improvement programs uh, in the way that they had been uh, described and pitched to the American and English people um, as, but were really more about inflating asset values. Um, and, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, that was, I was like very much like considering a more wonky trajectory of <laughs> for my life, for sure. Um, I still try to stay pretty wonky, but there's definitely a lot more like yeah. And was that uh, a graduate program or were you undergraduate or what, what, what's the education yeah. that you've been through? It was, a, that was an MPhil. Um, so like a master's of philosophy, which is like a one year at Cambridge after you do your undergrad. 
Uh, my undergrad, I got a BA in ethics, politics, and economics, um, but I minored minored kind of in 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 writing and journalism and computer science was always kind of a hobby thing for me. I never really expected it would become my my career. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And then uh, th- this is fascinating. And then STEM, uh, the product. Uh, yeah. Describe again how you came about building that it was that directly from the storybook uh product yeah exactly so we this kind of product formula of like there's a a box and inside there's like the there these beautifully like designed pieces and you put them together then the device like shows you how to put together some blocks on a screen and you make something that this sort right. of construction esque ste- stem kit slash software esque things we'd done them in all these different domains. So we'd like we'd done a computer, which was like something you plugged into your TV. We'd done a tablet, which had a touch screen. We'd done uh, a magic wand, like was literally an electronic wand that you would build and then cast a spell on a screen. We did um, we did a, a board of, of lights that you could like paint on. We'd done a camera that you could actually put the camera together and then change out the lenses and do digital photos and make your own Instagram filters. So it was all like making, like the, 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 the slogan of the company was like, anyone can make, you know, anyone can make. You might think it's only for some, but anyone can make. So we then, we, we applied this idea to music and we'd been experimenting with machine learning for the Harry Potter product because the Harry Potter product effectively, effectively had to filter out a lot of motion data in order to capture the precise motions of the Harry Potter spells. So Wingardium Leviosa, et cetera. We went to do a music product next called the speaker kit or the stem speaker. Um, that was like this kind of orb like thing. You would put the top and the bottom together. And then there were these knobs on where you could like control the stems as they the music as it was playing through, you could kind of filter the music up and down. And that was ultimately um, the product that I think helped solidify um, our relationship with Kanye because when we saw it was when he saw that was up and running, he was like, Can I put my album on this? Because he he always liked our design, you know. When I first met him at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, um, he'd like picked up our computer kit and he was like, this is fresh. Um, uh, Can you give me this dope clear tablet joint? And we got on the phone and, you know, he had a real enthusiasm for for the look and feel of of what we were doing. And um, he said he liked the simplicity and he liked that anyone could understand it. And um, yeah, I mean, it was a very... uh, a uh, magical moment uh, for me because I'd always been such a fan of his music and I'd seen him as a really, uh, you know, inventive thinker. And, I, you know, at that time, he'd, he'd had a lot of criticism because he'd endorsed President Trump. Um, and that was always a concern for, for me because, um, uh, you know, uh, I feel that, um, that uh, President Trump uh, is a fascist. So when my favorite artist had endorsed him that had always been a concern for me. Um, but I, I kind of like put it aside for, for years and we became friends and we became um, kind of uh, creative allies. You know, I would, I would help him with his music. I wrote lyrics on one of his albums, strangely enough. I'm a lyricist on Jesus is King. Yeah. yeah which was so weird, but so great and a blessing. And he, and he would help me think through some things, you know, um, about my business, about um, how to present the products, uh, how to communicate the products. Um, and that was a that was fruitful. We worked on many different products, actually. Um, refrigerators, lights, appliances, um, speakers. Had, we, we touched all sorts of different domains. Um, but th- even telecommunications, but what um, ultimately came out was the STEM player. And interestingly enough, because this is the Ion AI podcast, the thing that in some ways contributed, at least from a product perspective, to our uh, 
kind of exiting the partnership was not only um, the, the the terrible things that he said and the terrible, hurtful, anti-Semitic things that he said, although, as we say in, in Judaism, Dayenu, that would have been enough. <laughs> but it was also, he was... Um, was it he was very opposed to the use of AI at all in the product. And I always saw it as a very magical element that you could bring any song, separate it into the stems, hear it in this new way. His view was it should be just Kanye music on my stem player. And that to me was uh, was was kind of a, a place where we, we started to, you know, kind of move apart. Was, I remember one quote recently that I heard was that the time now is very much like the time um, at the beginning of the internet where there are organizations that are just going completely uh, AI native that live and breathe AI that are thinking about how to bring it into all of their processes. And then there are organizations that are like, oh yeah, we're aware of this. And we think uh, we may have a strategy around it. It's very similar at the beginning of the internet. And I think we were just, you know, we, we'd like to believe we're in the right camp and thinking that something truly transformative has occurred um, in the, certainly as you put it, the, the applications of the fundamental research. Um, and, you know, three years, really three years ago, the major breakthroughs were made and now they're, they're starting to be instantiated in, right. in the cons cons yeah. products. So. Yeah. Let me just ask a couple of questions before uh, moving on with uh, where you're going. Uh, so just for listeners, the 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 product on uh, on the shelf behind you uh the stem in that product is the acronym for science technology engineering and mathematics mm -hmm. but the stem in the stem player refers to uh, a, a is a musical term right for for uh I don't is it one instrument or one group of instruments or or uh sounds within uh, a larger yeah the the uh, position maybe I can even uh share my screen here um is is that within the within the rules of the podcast yeah sure yeah uh, go for it but uh you know this this the stems of songs are the um are the pieces of the songs they're the ingredients you know so the vocal, the drum, the bass, the instrumental, you know, those are the, those are the stems. And so our technology allows you to split any song into those pieces and hear them independently. So you, uh, you get the basic idea, which is if you go to stem.tech, yeah. you can hear the vocals, the drums, the bass, the instrumental of any song either by itself um, or in combination with the others in any way you choose. So it makes the music uh, a deeper uh, listening experience. Um, and also we can get to this maybe later. It also allows for songs to be combined in new ways. Yeah. And, uh, and is that using uh, some machine learning algorithm to separate the channels? That it's, uh, I've talked to people on Birdsong, for example, I did an episode on isolating individual uh, bird songs within a cacophony of the forest. Yeah. So the yeah the 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 problem of um, what's called in in audio uh, like source separation is is basically the same in in those two instances. You're looking to you know, you, the audio comes into your ears and, you know, there's just, you know, millions, billions, depending on what scale you're looking at, of different frequencies that are all intersecting. And But certain um, human recognizable things have do cluster around certain frequencies. So for example, you know, voices tend to be of a higher frequency than um, percussive elements or bass elements in a song. Um, you know, the bird songs of a particular species of birds may cluster around a similar recognizable set of frequencies. So um, source separation has actually been a thing for like 50 years, even since like radio, yeah. radio was around, like I'm, I'm getting this radio stream in. Can I just in an analog way um, filter out the, the signals and get kind of different bands of, of the audio and either even like security and um, radar? based uh, 
either security and radar applications of some of the same technologies. The big change came really in the last three years to source separation when generative um, machine learning techniques were applied, effectively um, supplementing the weaknesses of traditional uh, signal-based source separation, which is to your ear, um, a machine just from an analog perspective, filtering out a particular band of frequencies, even if that band dynamically changes um, with a bunch of subsequent parameters, your ear will categorize as a voice just ranges of, of frequencies that um, are more nuanced and subtle than can be picked up by just a brute force um, sorting algorithm. So the the generative approach is basically to start with source separation and then use tagged data. So data that's been tagged as vocals, drums, bass, or instrumental, or yeah, I guess as a, you know, a finch, uh, a skylark, or to supplement and actually fill in what's missing out of those um, analog separated stems and techniques even from the synthesis of uh, voice, like uh, Google's WaveNet architecture, which is now used to, in most voice simulating um, technologies, can be used, funnily enough, to fill in the missing parts of like a drum or a bass, um, because there are some mm. similar um, qualities, it seems, in how humans perceive the different parts of music to the, how they perceive the human voice. So th those were two of the big breakthroughs using kind of a more generative approach to traditional analog separation using techniques from human speech synthesis um, uh, in the uh, prediction uh, objective functions uh, of that uh, technique. And uh, on top of that, there are also improvements that have been made in just data handling and data processing that make it faster um, to actually get those stems out of the 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 model and to the client whether it's like a web browser an application or a piece of hardware so that sort of stem separation is at least as we do it and and as it exists today and uh, i only have half an hour left i have a hard stop at five no but, uh, uh, there's so much to talk about so first of all you're at ces showing a bunch of products yes you're at a presumably at a booth and you know you got your signage up you got products and people are coming and what kanye west just walks up or is it was there like one of his people comes up says hey this might be interesting would you like to meet with kanye so one thing I learned about Ye over the years, which was really, uh, I'll answer, but it's like he does a lot of stuff directly himself in a way that is very endearing um, because, you know, we all know this world famous guy, but he's very much like he's raw. He goes at it himself, which is so the, the actual like I'll set the scene, um, which is I was at CES, but I was actually not at the booth on the on the day Kanye came down. So I was in my hotel room. I was in my boxer shorts. I was kind of sleepy and I was catching up on emails and, you know, thinking, okay, it's the last day. No one's coming through really. We've gone through the big days. And my, um, my colleague and friend Vidal at the time just texts me. I pick up my phone and it's a picture and it's uh, the table in front of our booth. We had a nice big area. We'd done the thing with Warner Brothers that year. So we had a nice big area, two, two walls table with all the computers and at the back of the table there was just Kanye standing holding looking at the computer and I was like I was like oh damn I was upset because I was like Kanye is my favorite I'd been interviewed in 2015 and I'd said if there was one person I could pitch my business to who I haven't pitched yet it would be Kanye and um I was kind of annoyed but also look at that i wasn't there i was like oh but then i was like okay let's see what we can do about this so i called my other colleague greg who was there who actually studied at berkeley college of music and is a great drummer in his own right and i was like greg what's going on he's like yeah kind he's just here and he's you know he's, he says you know he loves the tablet he, you know he said get me that dope clear tablet joint which i'll never forget and i'm like yeah we'll get him a tablet and i was like yeah we're getting him one like i was like hey 
you know, go put him on the phone. And, and um, he was like, I don't know, Alex, like there's people gathering because he'd now spent a long time at our stand, okay. people gathering, people realized who he was. He only had two sort of handlers with him. And um, Greg was like, I don't know, I can't, I don't know if I can get to him. And it, I was like, Greg, just walk through the crowd, walk past his bodyguard and hand him the phone and say, Alex, the founder of Kano wants to speak to you. And uh, he was like, all right. And I just hear this <laughs> rustling and, um, you know, I, I hear this like kind of voices in the background and I hear Greg's voice and then I hear more rustling and I hear like, hello. And I was like, hey, is this Kanye? And he was like, he was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, wow. Nice to meet you. And he was like, yeah, man. Nice to meet you too. I love what you're doing. It's fresh. And I was like, oh, well, coming from you, that means so much. What do you like about it? And he, you know, it's like, I love the simplicity. I love the transparency. I like that anyone can understand it. I asked him a couple of questions about his kids, how they deal with technology. And he was like, it was very loud. We couldn't really hear each other. And then it was like, hey, I'd like you to come to Calabasas to work with me on education farming the next generation of technology we're building a team <laughs> and this was very yeah you know he was he was always like doing all the he was always thinking about all these different things and um you know i went to go meet him um at his house for breakfast and the meeting got changed locations and you know chris jenner stumbled into the meeting and so kim was there and then the meeting got redirected and you know, yeah, and I just kind of like, he was looking at all our products, because we always make tons of products. I've worked with the same people for a really long time. My colleagues like Bruno, James, Tom, we've just been going for it. And even though our first thing was for kids, the whole idea was really always about more than just kids. It was about really STEM as perceived as most broadly. It was about the idea of like, you know, the world being something you can take into pieces and put back together again. And I think the the project with Kanye gave us a lot of confidence that the quality of our product design and the quality of our team and business was such that the biggest names in the world were interested in getting involved. And then the advent of a solution to the problem of music decomposition around the same time, plus with this Kanye relationship, just kind of came together to make STEM player something that um you know obviously has set the stage for many other innovations in the space and and i think now has given us a new platform to grow from as well um right. okay and uh i mean I, I i have more questions about uh the kanye west episode but so you build this product he releases his album on it the product blows up within a certain uh market uh did it go through an arc? Is it still out there? And then I'd like to hear what you're what you're working on now. Absolutely. So, yeah, no, the product um, it was a really interesting story because there were so many different projects that we put together with Yay. And of course, as a business person, I was like. I wanted to finish one of these projects with yay like i because we had a good relationship you know we were able to get a lot done but he he always struggled with finishing stuff and i felt like he would bring me into the equation when he wanted something to get finished and get done because i'm you know i'm the kind of guy i'm like quite a like i want to get things done you know so so like um he would bring me in and like basically it was around this album donda you know we went back and forth, you know, we got in arguments. I went out to Wyoming. I was on the ranch with him driving around in ATVs. Um, and um, the STEM player at the time wasn't even our main focus. We were focused on a different device. The STEM player, you know, we started a project with him, but then the project got canceled and the contract got terminated. And it was like, we were focused on something else. So we ultimately decided we weren't sure if we were going to be able to move forward with Kanye at all, just because he wasn't really like, um, first of all, from a business perspective, there were, there were issues. And then it just didn't seem like, although I really thought he was creatively gifted, that he was actually going to get anything done. So I proceeded to just take out the STEM player as you know, our own product. And it was during that time that we really emphasized and developed the, the AI element that uh, Kanye was super against. Because we were like, well, 
if we're not going to get a Kanye album on this, we're going to just create it so that anyone can easily. Uh, and that's really the direction that we've taken since. Right. But but Kanye um, did ultimately reach back out around Donda, did ask about, let's put something out. We had devices ready. We designed the exterior of the device to kind of work well with what he was doing at the time. And then he, right before the release of Donda, put um, his album on it. That was non-exclusive. We sold um, a good number of units just as pre-orders because people were excited. It's the first time they'd seen the device. Kanye gave it a big stamp of approval from an audio and music perspective and fashion culture perspective. Then during the rollout of his second album of that cycle, Donda 2, he actually got to a point where he was so frustrated with his relationships with the record labels and with um, with the major streaming platforms that he decided he would put uh, his album only on the stem player. Um, so it was completely exclusive. We worked on all the communications and the content and the marketing. Kanye, you know, put it on our device because I think he felt it was a better way to experience his music. You could hear the, the music in this new way. And um, I'm very grateful in a, in a certain sense to him for, you know, doing that. But I think also on his part, he was smart. He saw that this was like a future thinking thing. You know, the device ended up on like was everywhere. It was on Joe Rogan. Snoop Dogg was sharing about it. Like um, people were using the stem player box to propose marriage to their fiance, putting the ring in the box. It was like, it was a great, it was a great time. Um, and that, that led to a certain wave. Um, we ultimately had to dissolve the partnership, but the stem player continued to sell. Uh, we sold out of the first uh, 100,000 that we made. Um, and uh, we've been preparing to release the STEM 2 uh, this December. Okay. Uh, now, uh, one question. Uh, why the hardware? I mean, this could all be on a on a web interface. Well, the, the, the I think with the STEM 1, the STEM player, there was a collectible quality there was a sort of um i'm holding the music in my hand um i'm using this new kind of interface to interact with music in a new way it was almost like an art piece you know it was like it, it was very it was a very conceptual product in a way it was like you get this and you get the album and you can listen to the album in this new way like you can flip it reverse it chop it loop it but i think for the direction of STEM for all, for accessibility, we, we, we knew that it would soon become a technology and a service that you could, you could access on other people's hardware, as we like to call it, your MacBooks, your iPhones. Um, and we did go in that direction. Um, and we do have a service where you can uh, enjoy some of the magic of STEM audio now in your browser, on your phone, wherever you are, and that's under frequent iteration and development. Um, with a good number of active users. Um, the reason for the hardware, though, because we haven't ab abandoned hardware, is we do see some opportunity, frankly, in music audio hardware today. We see an opportunity to create devices that feel different that, to the existing devices that are softer and squishier and more like an extension of your body you know, that are like one piece and can stretch and bend and are malleable, more like, again, a, an organic system rather than a technological one. And inside them, a more organic style of intelligence based on a neural network, one that can um, take what you love to listen to from the Bluetooth stream or even directly on the device and augment it and transform it just subtly. So you're still listening to the, you know, to the Beatles or the Beach Boys or Playboy Cardi or uh, little Dirk, but you're being introduced to new music because it's being mixed in. A STEM is actually being mixed in. And we see that as a new form of music discovery enabled by AI and actually a new way for music to be monetized. So that's probably the last reason. From a monetization perspective, the whole music industry is like pretty janky right now. Stuff is not working. You know, the pie has not expanded enough. And uh, everyone's just competing for space on these tiny little squares on this tiny little bigger square. We think if you can make a speaker and a headphones connected to the internet, 
where you can experience music in a really unique, transformative way, artists are going to want to distribute music to those devices as well as, as these ones that everyone else has. And consumers may be willing to pay a premium to hear music in this new format, um, which brings you closer to the music uh, on these yeah. new devices. Do you have a, a, one of the STEM players uh, in, in, within reach just so that I've seen them, but I'm not sure everybody uh, listening has. Open it up here. And then on it. Speed up, slow down, loop. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. And the new one, so you're working on a new iteration? Yes. <clears throat> so without revealing too much about the new one, um, so with, with this device, the, you know, the music comes loaded on it, and if you want to add new music to it, you, uh, you have to take the cable, plug it in, um, and plug it into a computer, and then you can access that web interface where you can manage the content on board, add your own music to it. But we really want, with the next device, to uh, remove that umbilical cord to the existing e ecosystem. So the STEM2 um, will be slightly larger, um, but it will also be a Bluetooth speaker with a much louder, just gorgeous sound. I think better sound from our ears perspective. And also we had some amazing artists work on it. Um, the nicest, fullest um, sound profile um, in a very unique form factor that you can put your existing music onto via Bluetooth. You just play music through it like any Bluetooth speaker and it will transform that music into stems live and in real time. So wow yeah that's you know maybe i did just give away a lot actually but that's you know you heard it here first um that's stem two's uh stem two's power it really should be um something that takes your everyday listening experience and elevates it rather than being something you know kind of special and precious and that has maybe a beautiful applicability when you take it out of the box. Right. Wow. Uh, and and uh, so, in in is the AI in it? Uh, are, are you building because so much is happening? Uh, certainly, since this uh, first iteration, uh, are are you using any of that uh, new technology? The the the. Uh, yeah sort of the conversational interface for example or or other forms of generative ai yeah i mean there's a there's a f many forms of of ai but um that are kind of included or in the product you know depending on how you define ai i suppose but um for the new product at least in the way in which it's advanced is um the stem separation uses a hybrid transformers model, um, not unlike the transformers model that chat GPT four and 3.5 are based on, um, the, um, the generation of mixes uses, uh, an AI, um, an AI beat detection model that allows you to find the downbeat throughout a song. Even if the beats per minute change, we also, we use machine learning, deep, I'd say deep learning techniques to um, 
filter through your library to find songs that will match together and, and will, will mash up and sound good together. Um, and then the data set that the, uh, the system is trained on has grown because we've generated so many stems um, since then. Um, we haven't performed the, a new training yet, um, but we do anticipate that, uh, well, I, maybe I shouldn't say even we anticipate, we're interested to see what happens when, when we perform that new training, we're hopeful. Um, yeah. And it will produce a better audio. Yeah. And uh, is this, are you, this is a consumer electronic device. I mean, that's your target market, uh, but it looks to me as though it would have traction in the music production uh, industry. Is have, Are you working on both sides or are you solely focused on, uh, on consumer? I think I think we 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 want to make products that we can um, use ourselves and really enjoy and 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 have you know no qualms with using them above any other competitor products in our uh, potential price range or lives um, products that we can recommend to our friends and family. Some of our friends and family, just because of the nature of what we do, you know, they are music people, they are music producers, you know, and, but I think we're careful, you know, it can be very tempting to go too far down the road of um, building features that um, over uh, uh, complicate an experience if you're, you you're primarily thinking about producers. We really want the experience to be simple, elegant, um, and deep, um, but not so deep that, um, that we lose people along the way. We really want it to be like a six year old can pick this up and just, just enjoy it right away. And it becomes their go-to music device. Yeah. Uh, the, um, I mean, I'm just, uh, th thinking, you know, I'm, I'm getting old, I'm hard of hearing, uh, it would gr be great to have a device that could could separate out one voice in in a party, Ooh. for example. Uh, and you know that's beyond music. But um, uh, has has uh, on the business side has the original stem uh, been profitable, or is it still a sort of a development product? Uh, and you're you're looking for to make profits on your next uh, product? The, the original stem was actually more profitable than we expected after all the twists and turns with the partnership. So we, we were able to produce a net profit on those 96,000 units. Um, and the gross profit was even better because the margins were quite good. I mean, um, without, without sharing too much, we were able to, you know, return um, enough to keep the business funded, um, for many months and to work on, uh, new technologies specifically, um, uh, in audio, but also in video. Um, we applied some STEM, um, separation techniques to video and it got some really interesting results. And on our, our site, you can see the STEM projector product, which is like a handheld projector that will project on a wall or a ceiling, which also uses machine learning to augment video and transform it in a similar way to that the STEM player does with music. So, you know, the business, um, the business is in a position where I think we'll be going into the STEM two launch with a good amount of interest in the products. Um, but yeah, of course, as a company that carries working capital and inventory, um, it's never been the the kind of easiest business model to choose. But that said, is there any business model that's easy? At the end of the day, it's about, you know, who, you know, making it something great, producing a great product for customers, communicating it well, and it doesn't matter what your business model is. Um, you just got to kind of pull your socks up and do it. Um. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, okay, well, we're almost up to an hour. Uh, is is uh, What's the website that people can look for? Uh, the website is stem.tech. Stem.tech. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, I've visited it, but, uh, uh, okay. Well, this is really fascinating. You're going to stay focused on music, uh, or, or as I said, this 
technology, it seems, could go so many different places? That's a great question. Um, I think for us, when I first um, started the company, I think one um, goal that I had was to uh, do as many different projects as possible, almost to hedge my bets, you know, but right. as, as I've kind of become more um, aware of uh, just kind of the world and, and how complicated projects come together, especially ones involving many brilliant people, I've become more appreciative of the fact that it's not, all, it's not always about like, you know, what, it's not even as much about what you're doing. Sometimes it's about who you're doing it with and why you're doing it, you know, and that's what really keeps you going. And I, I think what we've found is, you know, our long-term ambition is to apply, is to integrate this technology that's arising now into a better experience for every product in your life, you know, whether, and it goes back to what Kanye said, education, farming, technology. I, I really do believe that um, the people who are working in these mediums today have an incredible responsibility and opportunity to shape as the people working in this medium did 10, 15 years ago, you know, to shape society and shape the lives of, of, of billions of people. And I feel like, you know, we maybe we got that wrong maybe with the first contact we had with AI on social media, you know, this is our second contact, generative AI. And, you know, we want, we want to apply it to relieve suffering around the world, make amazing products that we would love to use ourselves and with great value. Um, but I think we're focused on music and audio because we see a problem set there that if solved, will unlock so much productivity, so much joy, for so many people that that can be our foundation to, to build to video, to build right. to cellular. So yeah, for the next three, three years, I think you'll see us pretty much exclusively in the kind of music space. And that's a pretty intentional focus to build a foundation for the future. Hi, this episode is sponsored by Salonis, the global leader in process mining. AI has landed and enterprises are adapting, giving customers slick experiences and the technology to deliver. The road feels long, but you're closer than you think. You see, your business processes run through many systems, creating data at every step. Salonis reconstructs this data to generate process intelligence a common business language. With process intelligence, AI knows how your business flows across every department, every system, and every process. With AI solutions powered by Salonis, enterprises get faster, more accurate insights, a new level of automation, and a step change in productivity, performance, and customer satisfaction. Process intelligence is the missing piece in the AI-enabled tech stack. Search Salonis, C-E-L-O-N-I-S, to find out more. This episode is sponsored by Digimark, the leader in digital watermarking. Digimark digital watermarks invisibly guard your digital assets to protect against misuse, prove copyright ownership, and verify authenticity. In the era of artificial intelligence, don't leave your images and other digital content exposed. Demand superior content protection and maintain trust in your brand with Digimark. 